Civil Disobedience I strongly believe in the principle of peaceful civil disobedience. It is one way that the impulse to liberty checks the powerful. I have not participated in it except by refusing to participate in the usual congressional vote-trading games, but I support those who have, from both the left and the right of the political spectrum. Many war resistors have been arrested and imprisoned all the way back to the Civil War, and even all the way back to the Whiskey Rebellion. Protests against slavery and segregation have prompted many to peacefully demonstrate and challenge the law. Protest against the tax code and the unconstitutional monetary system are growing more frequent. Any protest, even when protected by the Constitution, is regarded by those in power as a dangerous challenge to the authority of the state. It is indeed that. Much good has come from these protests, and sadly, many good people have been imprisoned for years and sometimes for life because of their protests. Though I have not chosen this method of protest and instead have chosen to promote change through education and political action, I admire people who do so as long as it's nonviolent and the participants understand exactly what is at stake. It's conceivable that someday I might consider it the only option. What tactic one chooses is strictly a personal choice. The greatest benefit of civil disobedience is the publicity it generates. This serves as an educational tool, so eventually it will help to change bad laws or stop an ill-conceived war. Although limited, it is more practical to believe that just because a protester is morally and constitutionally right, justice will be achieved in the courts. However, our courts are just as corrupted with bad ideas as are the executive and legislative branches of our government. Great changes have been achieved through civil disobedience, and the heroes who engaged in it deserve our gratitude. Their real reward comes from the inner satisfaction of pursuing the truth as they see it, not from a sense of sacrificing for the greater good. Admiring someone who practices peaceful civil disobedience and perseveres for long periods doesn't mean that one has to agree with that individual's entire philosophy. I like what Martin Luther King Jr. did to eliminate state-enforced segregation. The use of the boycott is a great tool to promote peaceful change, and King spoke out brilliantly against the unconstitutional and pointless slaughter of the Vietnam War. I do not believe, however, that his economic views were supportive of the free market. Even as he became more radical and correct on the Vietnam War, he moved to the left on economic issues. This is regrettable, but also highly conventional. In my view, there is a general tendency for people who are correct on war to be wrong on economics, and the same tendency for people who are correct on economics to be wrong on war. As sure as a person is willing to stand up against the Iraq war for its cost and militarization, he will be arguing for expanded and tax-paid health care at home. And sure as a person denounces big government at home, he will argue for dramatic expansions of military power. If we had a consistent philosophy of peace and freedom, we would oppose both socialism and war and be willing to fight against all forms of statism, whether domestic or international. Sometimes the domestic and international intersect in ways that remind us of this truth. This is when disobedience is especially necessary. There are many unsung heroes who have stood up against the involuntary servitude of the draft, especially when fighting in undeclared and unconstitutional wars. One of the best known to suffer prosecution for his beliefs and resistance was Muhammad Ali. Though he had joined the Nation of Islam and argued he was a conscientious objector, he was still arrested for refusing to serve and go to Vietnam in 1966. His summation of his beliefs as to why he refused became classic. Simply, he said, I ain't got no quarrel with the Viet Cong. No other American did either. Ali was found guilty in a Houston court in 1967, sentenced to five years in prison, and fined $10,000. The jury took 21 minutes. He lost his title and was banned from boxing for seven years. After five years, 
the Supreme Court unanimously ruled in favor of Ali. He never served a day in prison, but nevertheless paid a high price for his convictions. Sports writer Harold Conrad said after the conviction and the sentencing, he threw this life away on one toss of the dice for something he believed in. Not many folks do that. True, not many folks do that, but I disagree that he threw his life away. That fight against the state, he eventually won, though at a cost. And history may show that it was the best of all his fights, and the one that should have given him the greatest sense of dignity and pride. At the time, Ali's resistance to war and the military draft was seen by a majority of Americans to be unpatriotic. But they did not understand that patriotism is the act of standing up to the government when the government is wrong, and at great risk, stand firmly on principles that protect the freedoms of all people. Those who resist the state nonviolently, based on their own principles, deserve our support. The opposite approach to protest is the use of violence. Violence is a terrible agent of social change. Individuals advocating or participating in violence on occasion will associate with certain groups and falsely give the impression that they are acting as a bona fide member of the group. The media rarely have any desire to sort out the facts, especially if the group that is being wrongly blamed represents anti-big government views. FBI agents will infiltrate certain groups they deem dangerous. Government itself, spying on any private group, is dangerous to our Fourth Amendment rights, which is something people tend to forget. The argument usually is that it's necessary to keep the American people safe. There have been many examples where the government official not only urges the breaking of the law, but participates in it so the suspects can be caught red-handed. It was this abuse of the law that led to the tragedy of Ruby Ridge, where the government killed a man's wife in a pointless hunt in 1992, and the entrapment of various militia groups. It has been used in drug investigations as well. The use of government agents to encourage the breaking of laws in a sting operation represents government violence that can surpass the violence of the suspected criminals. I personally don't know of any organized group that is calling for the violent overthrow of our government. There are many individuals demanding a more just system that doesn't reward the well-connected with bailouts, nor punish those who only ask to be totally self-reliant and not be forced to be a ward or victim of the state. The vast majority of Americans detest the mere thought of violence as a legitimate tool for bringing about political changes. Nearly everyone still believes that changes are available through the political process. Many who feel helpless working in the very messy political system still see the benefits of working to change attitudes through education and understanding. Others endorse the principle of peaceful civil disobedience as a means for bringing about political changes. This is a legitimate tool that was practiced by many in the civil rights movement in order to eliminate arcane laws that forced segregation. Martin Luther King, Jr. understood its merit and the obvious risk of imprisonment and becoming the victim of government violence. Civil disobedience is a form of personal nullification of unfair and unconstitutional laws. Even the current left-wing pundits, who condemn all nullification arguments by strict constitutionalists, would hardly fail to see this comparison. Civil disobedience is a process whereby the weak and defenseless can resist the violence perpetuated by the state. The great danger is that when government gets too powerful and abusive, a greater number of citizens give up on education, politics, and peaceful resistance to bring about change and drift toward violent resistance to the state. The line between them is always murky, and some people are always overly anxious to resort to combating government violence with citizen violence. Though this type of conflict resulted in our own revolution against Britain, my personal nature compels me to argue for peaceful persuasion to bring about the understanding necessary to advance the cause of liberty. People must understand that we can't use violence to have our own way over others, nor should the agents of our government have that power. 
Even a majority vote should never be accepted as legitimizing government's use of violence against the people.